In this episode, I am joined by Charlie Morley, lucid dreaming teacher and best-selling author, and Dr. Garrett Yount, a scientist at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Charlie and Garrett discuss their recent pilot study entitled Decreased Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Symptoms Following a Lucid Dream Healing Workshop published in the May 2023 issue of Traumatology and explain why their initial results may show great promise for the use of lucid dreaming techniques in the treatment of PTSD. Charlie and Garrett lay out the study's design, the participant recruitment process, the lucid dreaming techniques taught to the subjects, and reveal what they consider to be the most effective techniques for relief of PTSD symptoms. Garrett responds to criticisms of the study design including that limiting the participants to individuals with prior experience of lucid dreaming may have biased the findings, and that the significant psychotherapeutic aspects of the intervention prevent any conclusions being drawn about the efficacy of the lucid dreaming component for PTSD relief. Charlie also discusses how his religious beliefs as a Buddhist influence his work, and reflects on the flowering of the altruistic motivation known as bodhicitta in his own life and practice. So without further ado, Charlie Morley and Dr. Garrett Yount. Charlie Morley and Dr. Garrett Yount, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Well, I'm so delighted to be talking to you both today. And Charlie in London and Garrett, you're in the U.S., I'm very delighted that we were able to get everyone here together to talk about your new paper that you've published together, Decreased Post-Traumatic Stress Disorder Symptoms Following a Lucid Dream Healing Workshop. Mm-hmm. And you've conducted, to quote the paper, a pilot study to evaluate the effectiveness of an online lucid dream healing workshop in reducing self-reported PTSD symptom severity. And I understand you've come up with some quite striking findings and I'm looking forward to discussing those with you. First of all, perhaps you could say something about how was it that you met and how did this study come to be? We might have two differing views on this, but I believe Garrett reached out to me by email asking if I would come and I think initially it was to do a lucid dreaming retreat at, um, at IONS, uh, okay. kind of before the idea for the study. And I think actually the original study idea from Garrett well, actually, this is quite cool, wasn't it? It was to do the, the eating thing. Am I correct? Yeah. yeah. So Garrett had this idea that he wanted to get people together. And you you did some sort of test of salivary biomarkers around like hunger. And then you got people to go into the lucid dream. And in the lucid dream, they would eat. And the kind of hypothesis would be that eating in the lucid dream is so realistic that it affects the um, the kind of satiation markers Uh, in the bloodstream. So then when they wake up, you could take another saliva sample and we would somehow prove the mind-body connection through eating in a lucid dream. Is that right, Garrett? That's exactly right. And actually it was not just biomarkers, but it was gene expression. So we wanted to show that a dreaming event could influence the regulation of gene expression. So it was a great idea. And that's how we kind of got together. We wrote a grant, grant proposal, which was not funded but then we knew each other. Then when this other opportunity came up, that's when Charlie reached out back to me. Yeah, so then the next opportunity, although I was kind of into the idea of the the eating and the lucid dreaming thing, um, it may not seem so directly relevant, but actually what Garrett was saying is if we can get proof of that, we prove that uh, a kind of internal mental process such as lucid dreaming which is completely like a closed circuit right you're asleep you're in your mind can affect gene expression in in a physical way so it was exciting um but when garrett came back and wanted to look at this study using lucid dreaming to um affect symptom severity and ptsd i was like okay now that's something i've got i've got some experience with i'm passionate about my kind of entry into lucid dreaming was through what I now see a classic PTSD nightmares when I was 17. So yeah, I was kind of hyped for that. And, um, and the original idea was to use, uh, to work mainly with veterans based in the U S and that I would fly over to San Francisco and work with a group of mainly veterans there, do one of the in-person lucid dreaming intensive sleepover retreats. And we would be checking, uh, to see if we could affect people's, uh, PTSD symptom severity within that process. In the end, COVID happened, so we had to do it online. Um, 
And actually the online thing I think worked even better because we could expand the reach to not just people in the San Francisco area, but to people all around the world. And in the end, we had people from, from the US, from the UK, from Australia, from Europe, um, some of whom were veterans, but many of whom were not, uh, but all of whom were in this same, uh, I always say the same storm, not the same boat. You know, we're not in the same boat. But people with PTSD trauma, they're in the same storm, in different boats, but working with the same storm. Um, and the group we got was was diverse and beautiful and human and all connected through this shared experience of trauma. And something really beautiful happened. You know, not only was the workshop a success by the end of the week, even before I'd seen the data, I was like, wow, that was really good. I witnessed some big breakthroughs there. No idea whether it's going to transfer into kind of uh, replicable data, but it was a success, you know, straight off the bat. I knew we'd done something really, uh, really beneficial, really special. Um, but then when we got the, when Garrett started crunching the data um, and then kind of crunching the data again, because he wasn't quite sure that these results we were getting could be real because we were getting such crazy positive results. Um, yeah, we started to get very excited about this. Part of this origin story is um, we wanted to do the PTSD study and we actually wrote a grant proposal that I didn't get funded again. But then Charlie was talking about it with David Hamilton. Um, what was it, Charlie? Were you on a podcast or were you in front of a live audience? I can't remember. It was Where's me interviewing David Hamilton for the um, Lucid Dreaming World Summit, I think we called it, this thing that we created in lockdown. And during the interview, we're talking about the potential of lucid dreaming to treat uh, PTSD. We're talking about the fact loads of studies have shown it can treat nightmares. That's like, well, well understood. But could it actually affect daytime PTSD symptoms? And we're kind of chewing the fat in this interview. And then I just jokingly look down the lens and go, well, if anyone wants to fund this study and has a spare 50K going, hit me up. You know my email. Ha, 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 ha. Mm -hmm. A couple of months later, I get an email from this dude called Constantine Kuss. Uh, who is an entrepreneur and an angel investor. And, um, you know, the, the guy's got some money to invest and is really into lucid dreaming. And he emails me and says, at whatever, 32 minutes and 30 seconds of your interview with David Hamilton, you make a joke about needing money to fund a study. Are you being serious? And I was like, yeah, totally, man. If we can get funding, we'll do the study. Um, and long story short, he, uh, he did put up that money and more, in fact. And we are really, really indebted to him. Uh, not only for funding the study, but for funding a study that helps so many people and has also, uh, I think, planted the seed to help many more because we've had the follow-up study since then and we'll probably do more studies too. Yeah, I want to add that uh, Constantine was really wanted to be in the nuts and bolts of design of the experiment. So it was really fun to work with him as well. And then also, Charlie's mentioned about in the end, we were like re-crunching the data and we had another uh, a co-funder come in at the end, Claudia Wells. So she also was one of the funders of the study. I want to acknowledge her as well. Great. Yeah, very interesting. And Charlie, I know prior to this, you ha already had an interest in PTSD, particularly working with veterans and using your lucid dreaming expertise. Uh, in that context. So I'm wondering if you might say a little bit about that. We we had a whole episode about that, our last episode together, mm -hmm. in which you discussed in very a great deal of detail your own work in PTSD and so on. I'm wondering if you might just say a couple of lines about a paragraph or so about that to situate to situate things and what and, and you know what were, what were your instincts? You you, you have I suppose the subjective uh, observations of of the effects of your lucid dreaming teachings with veterans. So I'm curious about that. And also Garrett, I I'm quite interested in what your interest in lucid dreaming and PTSD is and how, how you arrived at, at connecting those two things. So there's a, there's a question to each of you, really, and maybe they overlap. Sure. So, yeah, when Garrett approached me with the idea, I already had kind of seven years experience of working with veterans communities and other communities working with kind of high levels of trauma. And I had seen how lucid dreaming in particular could be transformative. I'd seen people just anecdotally, right? But them saying, oh, my nightmares have totally stopped. I've had a whole email folder full of these testimonial people saying uh, how much it affected their waking state. Once the nightmares stopped, their waking state well-being increased. But it was all anecdotal. I had like a gut feeling. I was like, I know this works. I know it works for some people. 
Now, I've never worked with a group which would be 100% PTSD. You know, even the, the veterans groups, uh, you might have like maybe 70, 80% of a group of 30 uh, kind of with, with chronic PTSD, but I had never worked with a group with 100%. So although I instinctively thought, I know this stuff can work for some people, when Garrett said, we're going to have like 50 people who are all chronic PTSD, 100%. To get on the study, you have to be working with chronic PTSD. Um, then I was less sure. Um, and in fact, to bring Constantine back into this, the funder, that the night before the study begun, I don't know why he late, waited so long. He probably was wondering where his money was going to, but he WhatsApped me to say, um, like, how many lucid dreams do you think we're going to get in the study? And I, you know, wrote back saying, dude, maybe none. You know, we got seven days, six days with 50 people, all of whom have PTSD. We might just be doing breath work exercises to help them sleep, man. I have no idea whether we're going to have any lucid dreams. Um, and I really meant that, you know, I didn't know. I went in there kind of fresh. In the end, we had not only loads of lucid dreams, but like the percentage of lucid dreams that we had was... 76% of the dreamers had achieved lucidity. That's why the scientist was here. <laughs> Thanks, Gary. Yeah, so we had like really high levels of lucid dreaming. And of that percentage who got lucid, a high percentage of them had what class as a healing lucid dream which was becoming lucid and then either intentionally facing the fear, integrating the trauma, uh, sending love to the wounded parts of ourselves. Um, so in answer to your question, yes, I instinctively thought this can work for some people. I was really shocked and surprised, beneficially surprised when I saw that it worked for so many people. Um, and not only that it worked within the one week where we had that big reduction in PTSD score, but when we did the four week follow-up study, so like a month later, it lasted. There were still people who their panic attacks had stopped. They hadn't had a nightmare in a month. You know, people who had panic attacks and nightmares for like 20 years. After this one week study, they didn't have them anymore. Um, yeah, that was shocking for me. I wasn't expecting anything like the results we got. Can I just add on to that part about how many lucid dreams that we thought we might expect? Because Charlie was talking to me before about you know, at his workshops, kind of the, it, it varies. And, you know, we were concerned, oh, like we do all this, we we spend all this money, we set all up. And if we don't actually capture any lucid dreams within this one week, it's going to be kind of tough. Then on top of that, I have the worry that we're adding in this science component. You know, we're, we're bugging them, we're asking them to wake up and do morning surveys. We're collecting saliva from a subgroup of them. And so I thought, Maybe it's even less than Charlie expected. Maybe it's going to be more difficult for them to have lucid dreams because of the kind of the science interference as relative to the regular workshop. Mm -hmm. But as Charlie said, basically, it either was the opposite effects. It either enhanced it, the fact that they knew they were in this group. And and Charlie, maybe you could could recall the way that you would dedicate the whole experience. Uh, and I'm sure you do this at all your workshops, but there was a feeling that this, the science that was going to come out of this was going to benefit yeah. all humankind in the future. And I think that maybe part of that energy is what helped uh, more the folks get lucid. But what do you think? You're right. And I haven't actually noticed that till you said it, but this is probably one of the few scientific experiments that started with intention and motivation and finished with dedication at the end of every day, right? And actually, just because you point out, that's just something that naturally happens at all the workshop. That's how I begin and finish them. But you're right. People really did respond to that. Um, there was a real group energy that came together. And I think it was because they all were working with PTSD, not just some. So suddenly those boundaries of like veteran and civilian uh, person who uh, someone who's worked with childhood sexual trauma or more recent, you know, traffic car crash accident traumas. There was this kind of shared commonality of, yeah, we've all got really bad nightmares. We're all having panic attacks. We're all struggling here. And there's something we can do together. Um, I and mean, one of the things I'm sure Garrett will give us a whole long section on how the study actually worked and the, and the data we got. But one of the interesting things, which I know wasn't so good from a scientific point of view, but I quite liked, was the fact that although a high percentage of people who had the lucid dream and had a healing lucid dream had a big reduction in PTSD, there was also a small percentage of people who had a similar reduction in their PTSD severity scores, who did not have a lucid dream that week, which of course, for the science that kind of skews the results a little bit. But I was actually quite excited by that because it made me realize that just learning to lucid dream, 
knowing that there is hope in the hopelessness of post-traumatic stress disorder was doing something to people. Perhaps it was in the morning hearing the dream circles like that, God, that, that wonderful Vietnam veteran, uh, oh, whose name I can't remember anyway, and I shouldn't say his name anyway. He had a big, big breakthrough. And just to hear him share that in the morning, you could see people in the group welling up. And I think, whoa, maybe it was that. Maybe it was that moment that they saw someone who'd been working with PTSD for so many decades since Vietnam, who now had this breakthrough and whose nightmares had stopped and, and, and did stop for the rest of the week too. Um, so yeah, that, that happened too. Yeah, and, and Charlie, I know you, you're joking a little bit about the messing of the science, and it is true that kind of the cleanness of, okay, if it was only when they had a healing lucid dream did this, this has happened, but, but actually, you know, of course, it doesn't mess up the science, and I think it's really, really encouraging because uh, partly it means, because, you know, some people, they're, they're learning how to do the lucid dreaming, they're becoming aware, uh, more aware of their dreams and the relationship between their dreams and their life but they might not get lucid, but they can still have the benefit. You know, like it's, it's actually a really wonderful thing that came out of the study. And Steve, just to, you know, you read the title of the paper that was published in the journal Traumatology. And that's why, you know, it says a lucid dreaming workshop because it was the workshop that did it. It was the teachings that Charlie gave. You didn't necessarily have to have the lucid dream, but it was participation. And I mean, if, Charlie, you might talk a little bit more about the, you know, the, the various uh, teachings you've taken through that, that week. Um, but it was something about the whole experience that led, um, actually ep almost everybody in the group shifted to below the threshold that's considered PTSD by the end. And it maintained, as you mentioned, Charlie, a month later. Is now time to maybe look at that graph that shows these results. Yeah, that'd be great to show the graph. Yeah, go ahead. So this shows uh, the PTSD level. Um, it's recorded by a self-reported questionnaire called PCL, and it's used in clinical settings. And you see the line at the beginning before the workshop is well above this kind of PTS threshold in the middle. And then immediately following the workshop, you see it just drops way below the line. This is the average for all of the participants, and it stays that way a month later. Now, the error bars are so small, I don't know if they're actually on this graph, but they're so small that even when you graph it with the error bars, it's hard to see them. And the p-values for both immediately after and a, and a week follow-up were very, very low. They were you know, less than 0 0.0005. So it's whoppingly significant from a clinical perspective. So yeah, these were the kind of knocked our socks off when we saw this. Right. Can you just tell us uh, what the p-values are, Garrett? Oh my gosh. Okay, I can say what a p-value is. I'll try to do that. Um, it is fun to translate it into what it means in regular language, but it's kind of hard to do. I'm hard for you to remember how to do it. Um, so typically scientists will choose the threshold of a p-value of less than 0 0.05 to call it significant. and what that means is if you do the experiment 100 times and the thing you're looking at would happen just by chance, then you could expect to see it five times out of the 100 times you did the experiment. That's kind of what the p-value means. And that's just this it's an arbitrary point where the scientific community has said, yeah, well, we're going to call that significant. So if you had a p-value of 0.01, that means oh, you did it 100 times and it only by chance happened once. So that's even better. Um, so what we had was 0 0.0001, which means you did it 10,000 times. We did this experiment 10,000 times. The chances of us getting these results would only happen once. Wow. So, so if we did that, we did this experiment 10,000 times in a row. Um, and it only happened once, then that would mean, oh, yeah, it was just chance. But the fact that we did it one time and we saw these results means it's so far beyond the threshold of what we would call significant that, um, yeah, again, blew our socks off. Wow. I hope that's true. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't we all. So 100 and then 
one more zero is one thousand. Yeah, ten thousand. I think I said ten thousand. That's right. Glad it's you doing the maths and not me, mate. <laughs> Yeah, well, maybe we can discuss then a little bit of the, the nuts and bolts. I would like to pick up on a few of the points you've raised already, but perhaps we should cover the nuts and bolts first. So could you describe a little bit the, the design of the study, uh, its key features, also how you went about recruiting the participants and the criteria you used to uh, exclude or include participants and so on? Perhaps you can talk a bit about, about the sure. nuts and bolts or meats and potatoes uh, of the study itself. Yeah, the meats and potatoes of the study. We started out with, you know, this is a pilot study. So it means that everybody that we enroll in is going to get the real deal. And um, the idea of a pilot study is to really just do the first test to see if there's any sense in even trying to do this. You know, again, we weren't sure if poking and priding them and asking them questions to during this workshop was going to interfere with the outcome of the workshop. So we knew from history that Charlie's workshop, the folks were having these great responses. So, okay, if we're gonna measure all these things, is that gonna muck up the works? So in the pilot study, you, everybody's in there. They all get the active ingredient. They're all with Charlie during this uh, one week workshop. And we had, had to switch to do it online because of COVID at that point. So we reach out to people worldwide at this point and recruit folks that have chronic PTSD. And then they, um, you know, they do a consent form and they answer some questionnaires. And um, some there are protected categories that we were not able to exclude, you know, able to include, like pregnant women, children. We did exclude folks that were too high on the PTSD scale. Um, because we didn't have the, you know, the clinical expertise on site with them. So that was kind of how we, we ended up with our, our first batch of recruit, you know, people that were interested in the study. And so then we take them through another screening, um, and ask them some more detailed things. For example, have they ever had lucid dreaming, a lucid dream before? How often have they had that before? Um, because we... We're thinking that, again, this is the beginning of the study. We were a little bit fearful that we wouldn't capture any lucid dreams during the week. So we thought we could kind of stack the deck in our favor by um, including folks that had had lucid dreams before. So, you know, to increase the chances they would happen during this week. And we kind of, so that's how we kind of prioritized folks that had, that was our intention to prioritize those. Now, in the end, we had um, we had some of those, but we also had folks that had never had lucid dream before. So it was heavily more weighted on folks that had lucid dreams before, but it wasn't exclusive for them. So then, in, you know, crucially, we did our pre-workshop uh, outcome measures before they ever set ever set eyes on Charlie. So none of his charisma could even begin to seep in yet. We're just like, okay. So they took their all these questionnaires about their experience of nightmares. And uh, we chose not just to ask, you know, how many nightmares or how often do you have nightmares? One of our collaborators, uh, Tadis Stumbries at the University of Vilnius, Vilnius um, very excellent researcher in this field, developed a tool for uh, measuring the experience of nightmares. Well, not just the frequency, but the amount of distress. This is a validated tool. So we asked them about their nightmare experience. We asked them about the PTSD. We asked them about a whole slew of well-being um, measures. And so this is all on the day before the workshop starts. So this is kind of the baseline. And that's where you saw the one value for PCL, uh, the PCL5 value, the PTSD value that started above the threshold. Um, so that's all the day before the workshop. And then there was a subgroup of the dreamers that were local to my lab in San Francisco where we collected saliva. We had them collect saliva for us. Um, waking, they woke up. First thing they did before anything else, even a sip of coffee, they you know gave a little saliva collection. And then they did that again a half an hour later. So that's all on the day before. Then on the day, 
um, we introduce Charlie and he launches into his uh, workshop. Um, so Charlie, you can talk a little bit more about that, but just as, a, as you do, remember that each morning then, they're gonna, when they wake up, they, in their email, they have a questionnaire from a scientist that says, you know, did you remember having any lucid dreams last night? And then if they do, it goes to another standardized questionnaire called the Dream Lucidity Questionnaire. And that asks them a series of 12 questions and to the nuances of the lucid state. So, you know, Charlie, you, you know, talks about levels of lucidity, you know, different kinds of activities in, that can you know, manifest in the lucid dream. You know, it's things like, did you remember that your body was asleep in bed? Did you break any laws of, you know, physical physics in your dream? And crucially, the question we added for this study specifically was, did you remember your healing intention in your dream? And so if they answered yes to that, that was how we defined a healing lucid dream for this pilot study. Mm -hmm. And yes, this seems like a good time for Charlie to explain perhaps a little bit about his workshop design. So I'm curious, Charlie, what were your considerations designing this particular workshop and what was in it, um, et cetera? Sure. Um, the first kind of big consideration was that I wanted to have a psychotherapist on hand at all times so that I could do my stuff and they would be there to hold space. Uh, and if anybody had a wobble, this was the kind of a euphemistic term we used for it. They were able to message uh, either Garrett, one, the support staff or directly the psychotherapist, brilliant uh, psychotherapist called James Scurry, who's a Karuna call process psychotherapist and also a great lucid dreamer himself. Uh, and he's worked with me for many years. So he was there at all times uh, and he was used, you know, there were people who were, who were triggered and having wobbles naturally, you know, in the group and with everyone with PTSD. Um, so there was that, that was a kind of a, a big consideration. Apart from that, like I've been doing these workshops or the, the kind of the sleepover retreats for kind of 15 years now. So I had a pretty good protocol and I kind of stuck to it. Um, the main difference was that when we were doing the dream planning, which I'll uh, tell you about in a minute, uh, of course, we all had the same dream plan. You know, it wasn't to get lucid and uh, to ask what career path should I take? It wasn't to get lucid and do your Dharma practice. It wasn't get lucid and say certain mantras. It was to get lucid and intentionally uh, heal a wounded part of oneself, face a fear or transform a trauma, uh, whatever that meant for people. Um, but as far as the techniques, they were the, the kind of standard lucid dreaming technique. So dream recall and dream diaries and dream signs and reality checks and falling asleep consciously practice and mild and wild and uh, wake back to bed. You know, the, 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 the classic practices, um, I guess, set within the way that I teach them, which is this kind of bodhicitta motivation. So we're not doing this just for fun. We're doing this for the benefit of all beings. And as I said before, we did have that at the beginning and, and the end of every day, which... Uh, yeah, whether that did anything or not, I don't know. But I think it's important for me when I teach that we're doing it with that motivation. Um, I just got some, uh, I'll just read from some some notes here, some extra stuff about the study. So, um, yeah, two thirds uh, of the participants were female. Most were from the US or the UK. Uh, as Garrett said, no experience of lucid dreaming was required, but about 11% of them uh, had done some training in lucid dreaming before, but, you know, 89% hadn't. The six day online workshop. So they were at home. I was at home. Uh, Garrett was either in the lab or at home. Uh, we were doing it on San Francisco time zones, which meant for me and some of the other UK people, we were waking up at like four o'clock in the morning. Um, this is because originally the study was going to be for people in the San Francisco area and then COVID happened. So we had to do it online. Um, but for most people, it was like their, their daytime for the workshops uh, and then evening time uh, when we did the practices. So it was like two days two full day workshops online. And then we had two hour follow ups for the next four or five nights. So they had kind of uh, 22 hours of live instruction, taught them all the lucid dreaming techniques, uh, with this main aim being using lucid dreaming to integrate trauma. Uh, and each night when we had the booster sessions in the evening time for the people in the US, uh, we'd introduce a new technique and have dream circles from the night before and, and all this kind of stuff. Um, to try and replicate 
the lucid dreaming retreat vibe um i did something that was kind of a bit creepy or a bit cool depending on where you look at it but we had my my disembodied voice recorded um so people could if they were doing the multiple wake-ups technique sleep four to five hours and then set the alarm to wake them up and then they would listen to this recording on a kind of a YouTube audio thing of me saying, okay, welcome to the first wake up, uh, wake up of the night, take some time to record your experience. And then a couple of minutes of silence while they, you know, write down their dreams or have along. Um, and then I would remind them of the technique and invite them to be kind of guided back into the uh, dream state. And there were four of those recordings, the four different times of the night. So they could either do four wake ups a night, one wake up a night or, or no wake ups a night, you know, multiple wake ups are just one of the many, uh, practices, uh, but it can be pretty good to kind of maximize your chances of getting lucid very simply because if you fall asleep once and wake up once in the morning, you've got one chance of falling asleep consciously, of recognizing the dreams, whatever it might be. Um, if you wake up four times a night, you just quadrupled your chances of success. So we were doing this as like a full retreat environment and people were, it was made very clear to people not to continue this uh, uh, multiple wake ups when the study finished, but we were in a kind of a retreat environment. So if it worked for them then to do it. Now, a lot of them, because their sleep was so disjointed anyway, because of the PTSD and insomnia that comes with it, many of them were having multiple wake ups anyway. So actually it wasn't that disturbing uh, and they could just use the recordings whenever they woke up. Um, the main thing that I would say, the kind of core, core technique that really worked with this um, is something called dream planning which is like a three-step process uh, that I use at all the workshops and retreats. And I think, in fact, the last time we spoke, Steve, uh, the last podcast we had, I think you asked me what I think is the most vital lucid dreaming technique. And this is the one that I mentioned. Um, this is a dream plan. So I'll hold it up to the camera, but maybe we can put a shot up of it later. Uh, looks like a child has made it. This is in fact my dream plan. So it's an A4 piece of paper. Uh, with at the top in my next lucid dream and then a description of what I want to do in my first or next lucid dream. Step two is to draw a picture of it or somehow kind of, you know, abstract image, somehow kind of pictorialize it happening. Uh, and then the third one is the Sankalpa, which is like your statement of intent, uh, your will, your intent, your kind of call to action, the thing you actually do in the lucid dream. So this Sankalpa is the call out in the lucid dream. I'm healed. I'm free of my wounds. Wounded self, I release you. And then there's a picture of this kind of embrace of, of the wounded self. So we got people to make dream plans. And these were very specific because everybody have a, had a different trauma they were working with. For example, there were quite a lot of people there who were working with childhood sexual abuse. And uh, what I realized, not just in this study, but, but a while ago, was that if you get if people become lucid and call out to meet their trauma, which has happened before, this one woman, for example, called out to meet her seven-year-old self, uh, which was, uh, she wanted to do this because when she was seven, there was some abuse that occurred and the dream just blocked her a bit like the lucid dream practitioner, Maxwell Hunter, who when he tried to meet his uh, alters, the voices in his head the first time it flashed up with access denied, access denied. There seems to be some sort of safety mechanism within the psychic apparatus that strives for balance. And yet at the same time, a bit like putting your hand into fire will reflexively pull it out in the form of a wake up. It'll kind of wake you up if you try and do something too, too intense. So we found that asking people to directly go towards their trauma uh, was neither a good advice uh, to give them, uh, and also wouldn't wouldn't work very well either. But we discovered that if people were to approach the part of their mind that was wounded by the abuse that occurred in their childhood, this created a kind of a buffer zone uh, that allowed the mind to very readily present them uh, with this traumatized part. And the way we did this was with classic inner child work. So if people working with childhood sexual abuse, they would become lucid and call out to meet their inner child. And then whatever appeared, which in many cases was literally a, a little kind of four or five year old version of themselves, usually the same gender, usually looking quite similar, although sometimes it was more abstract. Uh, and then whatever aspect of the inner child appeared, they would then embrace whether literally through a hug or embrace by sending love to it, uh, to the inner child or calling out some affirmations of healing intent. Um, a lot of people had a dream plan like that, and that was very, very successful. So. Some examples of the dream plans uh, that were engaged by the people, so I won't use their names, but we can share uh, some of what they did. For some of them, it was simply enough to become, if they had recurring nightmares, 
uh, let's say they had a recurring nightmare, they're back in the car crash that occurred. For many people, it was enough simply to become lucid in that nightmare. They go, oh, I'm not really back in the car crash. I'm dreaming I'm back in the car crash. Where's my body? My body is asleep in bed. I'm safe. This is just a projection of my mind. This is simply a replay of the event. And just to stay in the nightmare intentionally, no need to hug, no need to embrace, no need to send love. It seemed like it was such an empowering act to do what one had never done, which was to choose to stay in the nightmare, knowing that the nightmare cannot harm them. But actually, that was enough for many people to end their nightmares. In other cases, people were more active if there wasn't, if they weren't kind of experiencing the same recurring nightmare, they would become lucid and call out uh, these statements of healing. So, for example, uh, one woman who was on the study, she became, she made a dream plan to heal her dream body. So for her, a lot of the trauma was manifesting physically. And she became lucid and she calls out in the lucid dream, dreamer, heal my body, dreamer, heal my body. So just an affirmation. She's just calling this out several times in the lucid dream. And she said she experienced her body vibrating uh, with a huge force in the lucid dream. So her dream body starts vibrating like this. And then she hears this roaring in her ears, like this energetic roar, which sounds quite scary. But she says in the dream report, you know, it was a very positive experience. Um, and then she wakes up with this sense of kind of roaring in her ears and her body like full of vibration. And she was one of the, the, the many people on the study who experienced this uh, big drop in PTSD symptoms in the daytime. Uh, another person uh, <laughs> asked to meet and befriend her anxiety. So for her, her PTSD manifested in kind of a generalized anxiety. So she made a dream plan using the three steps, the plan, the picture, the Sankalpa to uh, meet and befriend her anxiety. She became lucid a couple of nights later as part of the study, called out to the dream, anxiety, come to me, anxiety, come to me. And her anxiety manifests, it sounds quite kind of weird, but if you think of the healing symbolism here, um, when she called out for anxiety, a huge golden lozenge, like a strepsil, you know, like if you had a sore throat, a huge golden lozen uh, lozenge appears. And as soon as she saw it, she said she felt this wave of like amazement and gratitude uh, as she saw this kind of symbol of healing this lozenge that had appeared in place of the anxiety that she had called uh, and then the third example just so people get an idea of what what, what they were actually doing the participants um, this was actually sent to me directly so i don't know whether we have this in the dream reports on the study um, i believe this this person was a veteran um, they called out to meet their inner lioness this kind of power animal, this symbol of their innate power, rather than the disempowering feelings they had had through their PTSD. And they called out for their lioness in the dream, and the lioness appeared, this huge female lion. Uh, and the lion guided her through the lucid dream. And she said, for the first time in my life, I felt safe in my dreams. I finally felt safe. The next thing I knew, I was waking up. I had had such a deep restorative sleep. I woke feeling refreshed, relieved, hopeful, and so inspired. I've never felt this way before. I've gone from dreading sleep to looking forward to it. What an incredible gift this is. Thank you. So everything was different. Everyone's lucid dream is different. Mm -hmm. But they're all essentially the, of the same nature, of becoming lucid and, and engage, directly engaging some sort of healing um, of their trauma within the lucid dream. Garrett, do you have anything to add to that? No, I'm just going through the remembering the emotions of experiencing um, the workshop with Charlie and just was uh, was really moving um, just to watch the, the healing happening. So, yeah, I'm just lost in the memories of it. So it was quite, quite beautiful. Yeah, it was moving, wasn't it? And actually, I'd like to say something because this is the first time I'd worked with um, with scientists. <laughs> and I've got to say, the scientists at Ions are like some of the most open-minded scientists I've ever seen. They've all got PhDs coming out their ears, but they were they were present in the workshop and being, you know, open to the effects of it. Of course, they were there for data gathering and getting saliva collection and all this kind of stuff. But you know, the the presence of the scientists added to it. It didn't uh, affect it in any way. And I think you know, there could be some kind of white coat syndrome that could have come in and affected the, the study in a negative way. And we didn't have any of that. Um, Dara, I just realized when I mentioned the saliva stuff there, 
you mentioned the saliva samples, but we didn't actually go into detail with that. Uh, so not only were we checking people's um, nightmare severity at the beginning of the week and their uh, PTSD score at the beginning of the week, and then at the end of the week after the study, checking had their nightmares severity dropped, had their PTSD score dropped, but also for some of the group, we were collecting saliva samples. Um, and I'll, let, I'll pass over to Garrett because this bit's really technical. Yeah, so we wanted to collect saliva samples to see if we could see any biomarkers change um, as a result of this, this healing workshop. So the folks that were close enough to the lab for me to go pick the pick this sped up from them, um, we, we invited them to be part of this subgroup. And this was, we chose the biomarker called salivary alpha amylase. And, you know, for reasons it's too complicated to go into, it's been, it's a, it's a stress biomarker. It's used in the stress research field. So we modeled it after um, a PTSD study that was um, done with Bosnian war refugees. And so this study uh, looked at the difference between uh, these Bosnian war refugees when they woke up, what was the level of the salivary alpha amylase and how did it change, you know, as the morning progressed? And they noticed that it was different than folks without PTSD. So we thought that, you know, in our study, everybody coming in is beginning with PTSD. So you would imagine that their waking salivary alpha amylase profile would look like uh, the data that was found with the Bosnian war refugees. And then maybe after a healing lucid dream or after this a healing lucid dream workshop, their waking salivary alpha amylase profile would shift to look like the, the control group in the, in the other study. And so that is what we saw. And so remember, this is a smaller group and not everybody had lucid dreams. So as it worked out, we had four, um, this is just four people that we actually got Live up from that, and the samples weren't messed up or anything. And luckily, for the science perspective of it, two of them had a healing lucid dream, and two of them didn't. And they had the two lucid dreams happen one at the beginning of the week and one toward the end of the week. So we paired the two lucid dreamers up with the control uh, participants, the, the dreamers who didn't have a lucid dream. Um, but the, those pairs at the beginning of the week and the end of the week and compared the, the way the salivary alpha amylase reacted uh, in the morning. And in both those cases, basically the after the lucid dream, the slope was more positive, which is what we were uh, hypothesizing compared to control. So this is you know just two pairs of people. So we can't say, and we didn't say in the paper that this is proof of this, but we did say, this is really, really provocative that it might, it's for sure it's the first time anyone has looked for, you know, physiological biomarkers related to healing lucid dream and the dreaming. Um, and the fact that it actually turned out the way that we thought we were hoping that it might was super, super exciting. Mm. Um, it was basically uh, looking for biomarkers related to reduced stress. And we were able to see an indication of that. And Garrett, this, um... The um, follow-up study we've done, because of course we have since uh, uh, done a hundred person randomized control study uh, in follow-up of this uh, pilot. We also did the spit collection there, right? How many did we do for that? We have 17 Great. dreams collected spit. In so the there's the possibility to replicate those findings in the follow-up study. And we've only just completed the, um, the follow-up, the randomized control, so the data has not been crunched, uh, but I was there. So I've, I know that we've got, we've definitely got some really strong, powerful lucid dreams that were had in that study, but the data is still being crunched. Um, and just something to say with the randomized control thing, um, we made sure, I mean, I just thought it was, it was a bit unfair that 50 of the 100 people were going to who were in the control group just had to spend the week just having PTSD and having nightmares. That's super unfair. 
And then I was like, wait, that's how most scientific studies roll. That's that's I think that's really unfair. So we agreed that uh, we would only do this study if the 50 people who are in the control group would get exactly the same workshop, but just a couple of months later and not kind of part of the of the study, but just um, just for themselves. So we did end up getting all 100 people uh, did have the workshop experience, but obviously only 50 of them we were collecting the data for. Right. And presumably you can and presumably you can compare that second cohort to themselves as a control yeah maybe we can just step back a bit so you know we got these great results from the pilot study and one of the first next steps and since it turned out so positively is to do it again in with the control so we chose to do this randomized control protocol where we recruited a hundred dreamers this time and they were randomized into two groups an active group and this control group and as charlie said the control group the the main function of it is to be living and breathing during the same time that we're measuring uh the outcomes from the active group getting the workshop so that means that so 100 people are recruited and we start collecting data on all 100 of them. Remember the day before the workshop starts, we do all the heavy lifting of getting their measures of uh, PTSD, their nightmare experience, their well being. So all 100 of them are in the same boat at that point, collecting data from all of them. Then they're randomized in two groups. One gets to do the workshop with Charlie, and the other has to wait. So they're going to get the workshop that it's going to be later. But importantly, during that week that the workshop is going on, we're still collecting data from the control group. So those 50 dreamers are living their life. They know they're in a scientific study. They know that later on they're going to get the active ingredient, but right now they're just living their life. So this is important because being in a scientific study, knowing that scientists are paying attention to you for these particular reasons can certainly have an impact on folks. So that's one of the, you know, one of the reasons we we have this control group. The pilot study results are fantastic, um, but it's still open to the criticism that, well, you know, they got invited to be in a study and they're super special that they got all this attention. Maybe it has nothing to do with Charlie's magic. It's just being in a study, getting attention about the fact that, you know, they have PTSD. So now in our the follow-up study that we were able to get funding for because of the results of the pilot study. Um, we use this classic design. And so the the design of um, having the control group collect data from them, and then later they get the atypic ingredient, that's called a waitlist control. So our waitlist control group, um, they we did all the work of collecting their data during that first week. Then later, whenever they're able to have the workshop as they're kind of finally they get it, the, the idea is we don't bug them then to collect the data because they're just kind of getting what they've been, you know, they've been waiting for. Um, and then at that point, we can, can um, you know, you're right, we would be able to collect data from them the way we did in the pilot, but we've already done that. So we didn't, uh, we didn't use the, the control group in that way. You mentioned there possible criticisms of the study. Maybe we could talk a bit about, um, about some of the limitations that you, you describe in the paper. Uh, to begin with, perhaps, to quote you, you say, none of the participants recruited were complete novices to lucid dreaming, and five participants had previously engaged in some form of training for lucid dreaming. So I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you could explain that. What do you mean by they were not novices to lucid dreaming? And what implications might that have for the rate of lucid dreams and the outcomes, et cetera, uh, in the study. Um, Charlie, did you say that none of them were novices? Um, because I thought I said some of them were. No, I got that 11% um, had experience with lucid dreaming before, but 89% didn't. Mm -hmm. That's that's a direct quote from your paper. Thanks. <laughs> Um, uh, none of the, I, I mean, what I mean to say is I quoted your paper directly there. Okay, right. None, well, none of the participants were completely you, Garrett, you wrote it. I wrote it. And what did I say again? None of them were. I'll read it to you again. None of the participants were complete novices to lucid dreaming. And five participants had previously engaged in some form of training for lucid dreaming. Yeah, well, 
I would say that um, lucid dreaming, I think from what I understand, the, the natural occurrence of it in the population, uh, you know, it's, I can't remember the percentage, it's much more likely in younger age um, and it can be taught. So obviously this is an experiment where we're looking for the, the teaching of the lucid dream to have the effect. So I think that the reason that none of them were novices perhaps is because they're the folks that responded to this call for being part of a lucid dreaming study for whatever reason. People that were novices think it's too weird or they're scared of it in some way. So when we ended up with folks that were already open to the idea at least um, and they had some exposure to it would, um, I imagine, increase our chances of uh, seeing an effect with it. So if you want to think about kind of criticism of the study in terms of the implications, you would have to say, well, it might not generalize in terms of the rate or the degree, um, you know, meaning that within one week of training, they could have a lucid dream. That might, you might not expect that necessarily of a group of folks that prior to entering into it were total novices or had some um, fear of it. Um, I guess that would be one thing that could be uh, looked at in terms of how to interpret the data. Is that what you're asking about? Yes, I'm asking how you define novice. You, you, you mentioned an anxiety about the possibility of no lucid dreamings occurring. And so one way of increasing the chances of lucid dreams happening would be to select for people who had prior experience who were not novices in lucid dreaming. So I'm wondering if that was a deliberate selection choice to address the anxiety about a possible lack of lucid dreams, or if you think it was, you seem to be saying it's perhaps a coincidence um, that, that, or a sort of self-selection that those who applied for the study had experience were not novices. So yeah, I'm, I'm curious about, about that part, the intentionality, if there is any behind that and how you defined novice. Yeah, so I think it's both. So I was, I, as I mentioned, I was hoping, I was thinking that we get this wide range of exposure to lucid dreaming and I would want to skew it towards the folks that had more experience with it in order to increase our chances to stack the deck in our favor. Um, but as it turned out, the folks that did respond to the outreach, um, not, they did have, all of them had, had some exposure. And the way that we did that was a simple questionnaire. Have you ever had a lucid dreaming? Have you ever had a lucid dream before? If yes, how many? And it went on. So in this case, um, you know, everybody's had at least one in their lifetime. And then the the uh, the eleven percent or the you know, some of them had actually had some exposure to training as opposed, you know, as opposed to just a spontaneous lucid dream when they were a kid. So that would qualify. There were lots of folks like that, but there were a few of them for, that had, you know, actually read something online or done an online, um, some kind of training before. Oh, I see. So, so for them not being novice was like, they've never had a lucid dream in their life. Oh, okay. So yeah, like, I think yeah. about 60% of people have had yeah. one lucid dream in their lifetime. Right, right. So yeah, I don't remember what the percentage is, but you know, the chance, yeah, lots of lots of folks have had at least one, I mean, but some haven't. And, and you know, none of the people that, number one, our advertisements reached, number two, have active chronic PTSD, number three, are able to take a week off of work or, you know, able to spend an entire, you know, all these parameters um, we ended up, as it turns out, all 50 people had had at least one lucid dream in their lifetime. Oh, okay, cool. But only 11% had actually like been to a lucid dreaming workshop and stuff like that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. And um, another limitation that you mention in the paper to quote you here you say future studies are warranted that incorporate experimental conditions designed to distinguish effects unique to dream lucidity and to explore the mechanisms of action underlying the health benefits experienced following healing lucid dreams and um, you mention here also this might have been a non-specific effect of the work 
Um, the workshop format included elements of group therapy, such as social support, interpersonal learning, group cohesion, uh, and a safe and respectful environment. And then later on, you also say the integration of lucid, lucid dreaming training with the elements of group psychotherapy prevents any conclusions being drawn that are specific to dreaming elements alone. I wonder if you might talk a bit about that aspect. I think it's self-explanatory that sort of group um, therapy uh, elements are there in this sort of a workshop. And I wonder how looking ahead, well, I wonder how significant that is. And I wonder how looking ahead, um, that could possibly be excluded given, given the format of the workshop and given how vital it seems in dream training and Charlie's approach. It's not simply read a, read a piece of paper with a technique. There's a priming, isn't there, that, that you do, Charlie, a priming of, of, of the individuals to expect to dream or to, 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 to want to dream, to look forward to a dream. There's all this sort of priming, which is key to those lucid dreaming techniques. I, so I I was... mm -hmm. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, Steve. Uh, yes. Well, so I'm curious about, about that aspect that, as you put here, the psychotherapy elements prevent uh, any conclusions being drawn that are specific to the dreaming elements alone. Mm. I think the thing you said about priming is really important. I mean, that, um, you know, the dream plan thing that I showed, that's essentially like a vision board. You're making like a vision board for like prospective memory. Like, this is what I'm going to do in my lucid dream. Um, and that's vital to the lucid dreaming techniques. Also, the idea of each morning kind of sharing your dreams in the dream circle, you know, speaking the dream out loud is, again, a vital lucid dreaming technique. So it'd be very difficult, apart from perhaps the kind of electrostimulation technology for lucid dreaming, which is in its infancy, where you basically kind of zap a certain brain into gamma while someone's in REM and they can have a spontaneous lucid dream. I mean, that would be a way of keeping it really clean. Um, but, yeah, lucid dreaming is a practice that, you you know you kind of decide to do before you go to sleep you know once you're once you're in the hypnagogic in many ways it's kind of too late you need to have done the prep work in the day through the reality checks through the meditations um through the dream planning i mean of course the falling asleep consciously technique okay that you're doing kind of actually there and the and the wake-ups in the night and stuff but i think it'd be really difficult to separate those i think lucid dreaming in and of itself is a practice that um yeah, that happens very much in the daytime. It's a daytime practice that leads to nighttime experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I would add that aspects of the workshop, uh, Charlie, you mentioned before you filled in some of the details, but there were there were other parts like just the slow breathing exercises, the background, the understanding, the historical context of the fact that dreams are a window into our subconscious. And also, just the making that sankalpa, that that act, that different levels of mind, you're, all the levels of mind are with you at all times. So, mm. you know, someone that went through that process with you didn't actually have the lucid dream, but they still had that intention, right? So those are all things that we can't pick, pick apart. We don't know what or what combination of it all led to this great, you know, re reduction of PTSD symptoms. So that's why we say that in the paper that, you know, we can't claim, we don't know exactly what the, the active ingredient was. The one thing we can do, for example, compare it to the, the rates of uh, symptom reduction with other kinds of group therapy, for example. You know, you could you kind of go after that game. Um, but at this stage of the game, you know, we were really clear in the beginning. We want to maximize everybody's chances of healing, and we just want to see what kind of data we can get out of it. So we were not trying to piece it apart. Now moving forward, so the next step that we took was to do this control group. And that's just one step. That doesn't take us any closer to piecing apart what the active ingredient was from the workshop. It just gets us onto solid ground that it was the workshop. It wasn't just being in a scientific study. So it's just one step further. But even if we get the, the great results again from our randomized control study, we're going to have that same limitation because everybody in the active group got not only the lucid dreaming stuff, you know, everything that Charlie gave, which was, you know, was a lot. Um, so, you know, it's going to be one step at a time. Um, you know, ultimately, um, you know, I think that 
the the subject population you know there's so much to follow up with this and you know as we talked about in the beginning i would i really want to get to the point where we're showing dreams changing dreams changing gene expression and you know to so there are experiments like for example the one that we started out talking about we wouldn't want to work with folks that you know are going to come in looking for healing we might want to work just just folks that were going to have some some change like uh, hunger and satiety, you know, being able to see the changes in the body, you know, once we to grow after mechanism, um, you know, we'd have to talk about this over time, Charlie, but, you know, might want to shift away from a population of folks with PTSD to, to start really tinkering, or tinkering around looking for mechanism. Something you said there, Garrett, you speaking reminded me of a uh, mutual and late friend of both me and Steve, uh, Keith McKenzie who was the first veteran I ever worked with uh, who came on a lucid dream retreat and who has done a, a podcast with Steve. And I mean, he used to tease me because he, he had recurring nightmares, uh, not actually so much from his time in, in um, the army, but more from his time as a uh, firefighter, actually. Uh, anyway, that's a, that's another story. But when he was doing his dream plan exercise, he had such a profound uh, insight and release when he was making the dream plan that his nightmares stopped and he would tease me well charlie i don't know if your lucid dreaming techniques work because uh, the nightmares stopped before i before i could try them ha 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 we would kind of joke about it but it actually shows that it can happen you know the power of of you know the dream plan this kind of which is essentially like an art therapy exercise i guess was so strong for him you know drawing this new version of how this recurring nightmare would be that the nightmare stopped. So uh, again, both I'm expressing a limitation, but also I guess because I'm not a scientist, I'm less uh, uh, disheartened by the limitations. And I think I said on this study multiple times, I was like, we'd probably, you know, uh, may, well, I don't know. I said multiple times, I was like, look, I don't care if we have any lucid dreams over this next week. <laughs> what I care about, which I know kind of the, the funders were probably like, don't stop saying that, dude. Yeah. <laughs> I was saying that, like, I really don't care. What I care is we spend a week together and we work together to try and, and heal, to try and integrate our trauma, to try and sleep with, uh, with more benefit and more peace. And if that, if a side effect of that is lucid dreams, brilliant. And if not, no problem. Um, and probably it was that attitude of not putting pressure on people to have lucid dreams and putting the real focus on healing that led to so many lucid dreams. Because I know when I do the, the in-person workshops, the person who's there going, I've got to have a lucid dream. I paid my money. I'm on the course. Got to have a lucid dream. They can't even get to sleep, let alone get lucid. Hmm. Whereas the person who's come along thinking, God, I have terrible nightmares and no way I'm going to be able to do this. I can barely sleep. They're often the ones who have the breakthrough, which I think we saw uh, saw in this study. Um, also, as we're discussing limitations, and I think it's really important to do this because um, because we got such audacious results, you know, 85 percent of people no longer classified as having PTSD using the self-report scale by the end of the one week study. That's an audacious headline. So I think because of that, it's really important we look at these limitations. One, so we're not like selling snake oil. You know, I don't want, the last thing I want to do is give people false hope. And yet at the same time, I don't want to downplay how incredibly hopeful this practice is for people with PTSD. Um, so I think it's really important to look at those limitations um, and to say that this will work for some people and not others. Uh, we've only done a pilot study, but we have now done a follow-up study and that we don't really know how this is working, just that it did. Um, yeah. And I think it's really important to be open with that. Um, yeah. And also that this is, you know, this is free, yeah. non-medicalizing. Um, it's not habit forming. You do it in your sleep. It's worth a shot. <laughs> worst that can happen is nothing this is what i said on the retreat worst that can happen is nothing best that can happen is you have a massive breakthrough where you gain conscious access to your unconscious mind and you you plant seeds of healing that profoundly affect your daytime experience that's a possibility and also nothing happening is a possibility but very very few contraindications for lucid dreaming very unlikely to lead to re-traumatization um 
in fact, in many cases, you're much more likely to be re-traumatized in a, in a waking state therapy session. You know, the, the nightmare has an off switch. It's waking up. We've all had it where the nightmare gets so intense, boom, and you wake up in your bed. There's an ejector seat there, uh, which you don't actually have in waking state therapies. If you look at the way that REM sleep evolved in the, in the mammalian brain, especially in the human brain, it was, you know, factory installed for integration of trauma. There's no better place to look at trauma than the dream state. You know, noradrenaline is present in the brain at all times in a 24 hour period, apart from those two hours when you're sleeping and dreaming. At the point where you're dreaming, the brain drains all the noradrenaline out to create this safe space for you to explore either future threats or past traumas in a safe space of a brain that's free of noradrenaline. So like the, the actual kind of um, biological mechanics of the REM dream state is set up as a crucible for integration of trauma. So in many ways, it's the best place to explore it, even better, I think, than the waking state. I would agree. And can I add one more, um, you know, guess if it, if we if I had to bet, what was the one of the active ingredients that was responsible for this? You know, if it was going to be if it wasn't the lucidity, and Charlie, I'll try to remember it correctly, but you can you can augment hopefully. Just the way that you conveyed the the reframing of nightmares that I think almost everybody has before either you know be, i did before meeting you is that they're they're an opportunity they're your own subconscious mind speaking to you and instead of something that you you know you kind of stop and shut and it's it's more of an opportunity to engage and i think just that alone which everybody in the workshop got i mean i felt it and i i felt like i felt it through them just the the, the impact of that it's so profound I mean, did I say it close enough? Absolutely. Yeah, these these three reframes, in fact. And one of them is that uh, a nightmare is a sign of a healing mind. In the mm -hmm. same way as when, you know, we cut our arm, the blood cells coagulate and they form a scab, which is a protective layer that allows healing to occur beneath the surface. And so, too, in many cases, are nightmares, these immune responses from the wounded psyche that create this kind of scab that allows healing to occur beneath the surface. And just like scabs... You know, sometimes we want to pick at them. Sometimes we're ashamed of them. They're unsightly. We're scared of them. But without a scab, you know, we'd get gangrene every time we cut our arm. And there's there's studies for this now. You know, I've been saying this stuff for so long. And then now in the last five years, we've got these scientific studies that back it up. I mean, that one from uh, Rush, I think it's either Rush or Chicago University. They did a study on um, people experiencing uh, depression after traumatic event. So they'd had a traumatic event, like a car crash or the death of a loved one or something like that. And they were looking at their dreams over this time. Uh, everyone was keeping dream diaries, right? And they found that those people who were dreaming uh, were remembering their dreams, but not directly dreaming about the traumatic event that happened to them uh, were free of depression at a normal rate. Those people who were specifically dreaming about the traumatic thing that occurred to them were free of depression significantly quicker than those who weren't. Direct evidence that having nightmares about the traumatic thing that happened for you is in many cases good for you. It is a sign of a healing mind. It is a, a therapy session. Nightmares aren't a punishment for what you've done. You know, the veterans often have this. You know, it's not a, a punishment for what you've done. It doesn't mean you're an unspiritual person. It doesn't mean, uh, you know, it's proof that you're fucked up. I've heard psychologists say in some cases they are more worried when someone presents without nightmares after a traumatic experience than when they do. Because if they present with, with nightmares, at least it shows this kind of healing capacities engage. Whereas if they're presenting without, they might still be stuck in the denial and repression um, stage, you know, when these nightmares aren't coming up. And of course, Rob Nen, one of my Buddhist teachers who uh, uh, I've spoken about in, in many of my books, he was, um, diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder almost 40 years after the war zone trauma that occurred to him in the Rhodesian in the uh, in the Bush war when he was in Rhodesia in his early 20s and it was two things when he retired and there was something in his mind that knew there was now space to explore this and also the death of his guru within a short period of time seemed to re-trigger um, these these things these nightmares and he started having nightmares 40 years after the event 
But even in the depths of his panic, even in the depths of his nightmares, I remember him saying to me, now the healing can occur. And also he said, I'm so glad this is happening now and not in the bardo. You know, because he knew that in the after death state, whatever trauma is unresolved will come up. So he was like, thank goodness that this is coming up now. But it, there was a 40 year delay there, 40 year delay. But when the nightmares came, it was absolutely a sign of healing. And when he could integrate and go through those nightmares, um, that was part of his of him being PTSD free. Yes, very interesting indeed. And I can certainly sympathize with the difficulty of unpacking the psychotherapeutic aspects of the processes you've been describing from the lucid dream itself. Yeah. I wonder if there are psychotherapeutic, of course there are modalities that involve dream work that don't emphasize the study. That could be an interesting control. I'm wondering in the in the follow-up study, have you broadened the selection criteria? I know there were two two points you brought up. One is you wanted people with PTSD, but you excluded people who had too much PTSD. So there was a sort of a range of PTSD that you were willing to work with and not more than that. I wonder if you've broadened that at all. And I wonder if you've broadened the cohorts to include people who don't already have experience of lucid dreaming. No, we kept the, everything basically exactly the same, except recruited twice as many so we could randomize to the weightless control. Everything else was the same. Okay. I well, I I'm sorry, I didn't know what the timing of this, but I do have a 1.30 uh, deadline. Thanks. Yes, that's all right. Well, in that case, it's been so fascinating. Thank you both. I hope we can talk again when your uh, study, which I understand you just, you just completed it recently and you're working on the numbers uh, with this control group and a larger sample and so on. I'd love to talk about that uh, when the results come out and when you publish about that. Perhaps um, we could talk again. Uh, thank you both. Yeah, thank you both for your time. And uh, out of respect for your deadline, let's, let's uh, wrap it up. Okay. Gareth, do you mind terribly? There was one thing yeah. that I wanted to discuss, which we haven't had time for. Just my kind of idea of how this is actually working, how the healing is occurring. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the thing where I talk about the stuck record theory, about kind of lifting the record, allowing the kind of trauma nightmare to go through. Am I okay to talk about that without you? Yeah, um, yeah. Absolutely. And that's in the, you could point out it's in the paper. Uh, oh, cool. Yeah, would that sure. be okay with you, Steve? It would need an... an yeah, yeah, sure. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. Cool. We can, we can do a PS. That's, that's fine. Well, um, I guess that means you'll log off now, Garrett, and then I'll ask Charlie this question. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Before I go. That's all. Thank you. Nice to meet you. Thanks. Thank you. Fantastic. Yeah, I hope we do get to talk again. See you, Charlie. Thanks, man. See ya. Bye. Okay, so Garrett has gone to his appointment, and Charlie, you wanted to talk about one more thing, which is your ideas about if indeed lucid dreaming is a relevant factor here, what might that mechanism of effect be? Yeah, so I mentioned before about the process that occurs during REM sleep, where the brain kind of drains all of the noradrenaline from itself, creating this safe space where you can replay past traumas, or, um, uh, you know, fantasize about future threats and not be kind of re-traumatized by it because you don't have this noradrenaline in the system. However, for people with really high levels of trauma, very high levels of PTSD, in some cases, not all, but in some cases, their levels of noradrenaline are so high during the day and before they go to sleep that when they enter REM dreaming sleep, the brain can't drain all of the noradrenaline out of the brain. There's still a residual amount of noradrenaline, meaning that when they have nightmares, uh, some of the healing capacity of that nightmare is reduced because the brain hasn't been made fully safe. There's still a bit of noradrenaline in there. Now, if we look at what happens when you become lucid, there's a big drop in stress hormones. You know, let's say you're in a dream. Oh, I'm back in the nightmare. I'm, I'm back in the car crash, back in the car crash. Oh, whew. I'm dreaming. I'm not really back in the car crash. I'm simply dreaming I'm back in the car crash. There's a big drop in stress response there. So one of the theories is how this is working is that when you become lucid, any residual noradrenaline that might be in there is kind of, you know, the plug is released once you become lucid and that drains out. And that would tie in with um, Garrett's uh, working hypothesis about the uh, stress biomarkers that he was checking you know, the salivary amylase that he mentioned, that you would expect to see this drop in stress biomarkers. So that's one of the ideas. Um, another idea is, is simply the way the brain is working when we're lucid. 
So once the prefrontal cortex becomes activated, as it is once we have the aha, I'm dreaming moment, as far as the brain is concerned, we're awake. You know, this is an interesting philosophical point, but as far as the brain is concerned, wakefulness is not predicated on having your eyes open, walking around. Wakefulness is predicated on prefrontal cortex activation, which is where this kind of the seat of, uh, of the self seems to be in this kind of materialistic view anyway. You know, the me, my, I program, your sense of agency, your sense of I am having experience are all located or all kind of linked to the prefrontal cortex. So we can say that once you become lucid, the brain doesn't think you're dreaming anymore. The brain thinks you're awake. And that is why the brain lays down neural pathways in a lucid dream in exactly the same way as when you're awake, leading to all the uh, studies they've done on athletes and stuff like that, right? So we know that once you're lucid, the, the brain thinks you're awake. It lays down neural pathways if you were. So this means that if you are having a recurring nightmare, but suddenly you become lucid in that nightmare, and rather than the car crashing, you make the car fly, or rather than the car crashing, you make the car turn around, or with full awareness of your dreaming, you allow the car to crash. But with this deep awareness, there's no car, there's no body, there's no harm that can come to me. As far as the brain's concerned, you didn't dream that, you did that. So the hippocampus will restore this new memory, this updated memory in place of that old traumatic memory which seems to be the underlying mechanism for how trauma integration is occurring in the lucid dream. We could link that in, in as well to Bessel van der Kolk's theory that uh, for trauma to be fully integrated, the parts of the brain that were knocked out during the traumatic experience need to come fully back online for the trauma to be integrated. And interestingly, the part of the brain that is knocked out during traumatic experience is very often the prefrontal cortex, exactly the same part of the brain that becomes reactivated when we become lucid. And then finally, there's this idea that I call the kind of stuck record theory, which is that PTSD nightmares are kind of like, a, you know, a stuck record and they're looping and they're looping and they're looping. But if we can get lucid, even just for a couple of seconds, that's enough to lift the needle and allow the kind of record to spin before the needle drops back down again. Because I've seen time and time again, that although it can take people weeks to become lucid, if you're having recurring nightmares, it only seems to take one lucid dream for the recurring nightmares to stop. Because only once does the mind need you to witness it. You know, a nightmare is a dream that's shouting. It's trying to draw your attention to unintegrated, wounded parts of itself. So actually, it only needs you once to go, OK, I see you. I witness this. I consciously witness it. I see it for the mind to go, well, I don't need to give you this message again. You know, the nightmare is happening because we're not looking, because we're not witnessing. So it seems that to witness once is often enough. How much of what you said there is established and how much of that speculation on your part? All the brain stuff's fully established. So when you become lucid, the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and frontopolar regions uh, light up. Uh, and that was a study done at um, Max Planck Institute in 2011. Uh, so yeah, all the brain stuff, that's not theoretical. That's definitely happening. Uh, the neuroplasticity thing is, is real. I mean, these amazing sports studies that show you can kind of get better at athletic performance by training in your lucid dreams. Um, and also the nightmare stuff. You know, there've been over a dozen uh, studies, scientific studies showing lucid dreaming as an effective treatment for nightmares. So that's all pretty well established. Uh, the main thing in this study that was new was that can it not only help to decrease nightmares, but can it actually affect waking state post-traumatic stress disorder symptoms. Very interesting indeed. And, you know, seeing as we still have you here, Garrett's gone uh, for an appointment and we're, uh, you're still here. You mentioned a couple of times that bodhicitta is very important to you. Of course, that's a topic that volumes have been written about, what is bodhicitta and so on. But I'm curious, that um, concept from Buddhism, I'm curious what that means to you and why that is so important and central to your approach. I hope you're not asking me to define bodhicitta. I'm not sure I do a very good job, but um, well, from... uh, maybe I will then. What What do you mean by bodhicitta, <laughs> and why is it so central? I mean, if it's very central, presumably you can. You See, can the last it. question where you <laughs> checked me on the science, I was not blushing. I was like, no, nah, the neuroscience is solid. You ask me a question about kind of Dharma and you see me blush. Oh, God, what if I get picked up by all the Buddhists? Um, oh. So as far as I know, bodhicitta 
being made of these two words, Bodhi, the awakened mind, and Chi to sometimes translated as the heart or the essence of something. Um, I know that uh, some lamas describe it, this fine, it's kind of heart of the awakened mind. Uh, Alan Wallace has a beautiful uh, description of it as the spirit of awakening, which is wonderful. But it's essentially the motivation that we're doing something not for selfish means. We're not do it, we're doing it for the benefit of others. And not only for the benefit of others, but we're for the enlightened benefit of others. So at the beginning, the end of the workshops, we remind ourselves, we explore these practices of lucid dreaming with an open heart and an open mind, with the aspiration that we might be more awake, more aware, and more kind. And that's a quote from my teacher, Lama Yeshe. Uh, and he doesn't call it bodhicitta. He just, you know, it's when I asked him, like, why am I doing these practices? Like, why is it good to teach lucid dreaming? And he said, more awake, more aware, more aware, more kind, more kind. That's the point. And I was like, the dude just nailed bodhicitta motivation. So it's that. It's about reminding people we're doing this for the benefit of others. And at the end of every day, we're dedicating and going, you know, whether we had a lucid dream tonight or not, whether we had a big breakthrough or not, we made effort. You know, we dedicate our joyful effort of being part of this study, of at least um, being connected to something that has the potential to help people. And maybe some of us had lucid dreams, maybe we didn't, but we're here with the motivation to help you know we're not here yeah we're not here for anything else but the motivation to help um and for me that's quite important actually because as i mentioned before we did san francisco time zones so i was waking up at like four o'clock in the morning and everyone else it was like you know 10 in the morning and they're all fresh face and i'm like fuck man i really need a body sheet of motivation then because i was going like god that i you know i want to go back to bed but that helps you know, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? You know, it's definitely not for the money. So what is it? Well, because I love this practice. I've seen it help others. And also like, this is my mission. This is my mission statement. That's really clear that I think I, I mentioned the last one, you know, this, this kind of audacious mission to spread the Dharma of the dream state in the West as Padmas and Bhava did in Tibet. That's my mission. And whether I die in a week or 10 years or 100 years, if I have come somewhere close to achieving a, a, a might of that, uh, then I will die uh, with happiness. Yes, I think that's an, a, a very admirable altruistic motivation. And there are some other ways in which that's expressed in your work. For example, I believe you veterans, you allow them to attend your workshops for free. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm not in charge of veteran. Yeah. Right. I mean, I think that we talked about this in the last two episodes, particularly the last one, in more detail about your, your um, research and work uh, you've done. You seem to have a heart for PTSD and veterans in, in particular, and coming from this uh, body to altru uh, um, altruistic orientation. I think it's an admirable trait in what you're doing. I wonder, presumably, when you first became a Buddhist, you were not oriented in such a definitive way towards this ideal of bodhicitta. Is that something that I know, I understand it's something that one sort of programs oneself to hold through various practices in Buddhist, uh, in the Buddhist religion. Do you recall how bodhicitta grew this, this altruistic orientation that's so central to what it is you're doing? Uh, do you recall how that grew in you? What the key aspects of that were? In your own personal, the sort of, if you want, flowering of this uh, altruistic motivation that you've described? Yeah. Um, I think for me, actually, by the time I took refuge when I was 19, I kind of, I was ready for bodhicitta. I mean, I had a crazy teenage years, man. It was only a few years, maybe a three or four year period, but it was, it was nuts, man. I almost got stabbed twice in like gangs and violence and... Uh, just being horrible to people stuff that I really still I think I have released it now and I, I've made peace but you know it, it wasn't me it was this it was this deep insecurity and trauma that was playing out well it was me sorry absolutely it was my response I take full responsibility for how I acted and what I did but I think and then that culminated in this full-on like near-death experience I had this big drugs overdose and I was just like, what the fuck am I doing, man? Like, it was so extreme that I was ready for the other extreme. 
So when I got into Dharma, I kind of jumped straight in, straight in. And I was really ready for this. And it felt so normal. And I felt so like, ah, this is like, this is home. Um, so I kind of was ready for bodhicitta right from the off, but simply because I had been so un y for so many years before that, not for, not for any, anything else, just because it was, uh, you know, had such a crazy few years before that. And is it flower? I don't know. I remember, I remember one time at this retreat, like really early on, I remember looking at these nuns and they're Western nuns and they were like, Well, I mean, so yeah, they're, they're, they're quite fat. And I remember having this moment of looking at them and just going, God, they're so beautiful. They're so beautiful. But knowing that, like, they're not classically beautiful. They're kind of these overweight women with shaved heads. But I remember looking at them and feeling this deep beauty, like seeing the beauty in them and knowing that was something new I'd never felt before. And I was about 20 or something. I remember thinking like, whoa, something's happening to my mind. You know, that judgment of how someone looks and their weight and stuff like that had completely turned into seeing this beauty in them. Um, I don't know. I remember that. I remember thinking, like, oh, that's interesting. You kind of, you feel stuff changing. I guess it's like physical, isn't it? You know, you go to the gym or whatever, and then you, you don't see any progress. And then you're coming back from, from the supermarket and suddenly the bags feel a bit lighter. And you think, oh, something is, is changing. Even if I can't kind of see it, I kind of feel the strength changing. So I think subtle things like that, seeing my mind change a little bit. Um, and then just remorse, this deep remorse in my early 20s, deep remorse of like, yeah, and trying to track people down on Facebook and just say sorry. I think, you know, as I'm speaking, this is so obviously why I'm into working with people with trauma, because I know what trauma is and I know how it can wreck your relationships. So maybe there's part of my own healing that has this kind of soft spot again for people working with that. And I do sometimes when I see, especially the veterans communities, I see maybe some aspect of who I was or who I could have been or some connection to their heart i don't know who knows who knows very interesting indeed and um you know now we're i suppose doing a mini a mini uh conversation about you but um it is very interesting and even though we've had a couple of interviews before there's there's still a lot to talk about i think have you ever uh, doubted your faith or had moments or where this contact with this sense of mission, altruistic mission, has seemed distant to you? I ask that because in accounts of mystics and religious practitioners of all types, really, or most types that I can think of, certainly, all types that I can think of at the moment, this idea of desert time or of times where the, the, um, the, the water of, I suppose in this case, bodhicitta or altruism or depending on the tradition they express it differently, it seems very far away, dry times. Mm. I wonder if you, have you ever had, since that time when you, you, you converted in your early 20s, so completely and enthusiastically, here's the mission, I like this mission I'm, I'm in. Um, have you had moments of doubt, wavering, turning away, etc. In the, in the years since then? Yeah. So, so many times, so many times. And that mission thing only came, you know, that's only been my kind of formal mission for the last like five years or something like that. Um, of, and I don't know where, it, I think it did actually come from a dream, but this idea of, you know, spreading the Dharma, the dream state. Um, yeah, so many times, man. I mean, from right from the beginning, I, I went to Rigpa. Um, I mean, that's, that's, that's a head fuck for you. Um, Rigpa, which of course, you know, has been plagued with scandals and stuff like that. And, you know, to find out about those and then be looking at your guru and also having this information about him engaging in sexual abuse. And how do you hold that in your early twenties? Like God completely lost, lost faith. And then 
And then, as you know, as we shared in the last podcast, you know, three years ago now, my whole life kind of broke down when mom was, you know, the Alzheimer's start to manifest fully and my marriage ended and this crazy time, you know, deep depression and panic attacks. And it was, yeah, really, really, really difficult. Um, but I'm not sure at any point I really lost, I don't know, faith, because what is, you know, there's nothing really to believe in in Buddhism. There's no God. There's no one is coming to save me. No one is coming to save me. There's no God. It's just Buddha nature, which is always there. And there's nothing really to believe in. It's not like a possibility. It's there and you can feel it. I remember when I was really like proper depressed about three years ago. Remember the joy didn't go. I was unhappy. I was clearly unhappy on any and every scale. But the joy was still there. And that was interesting. I'm thinking, that's, that's interesting. The joy remains. Um, but yeah, absolutely. God, my practice is, is, is terrible and unreliable. And um, many big, great, great faith and great doubt. Yes, absolutely. When you say your practice is terrible and unreliable, I mean, how much of a problem is that? Is that something, is, um, that a, is, that, is that a serious, is that a serious issue or is that something that Buddhists say? <laughs> no, it's, it's not a humble brag. No, I mean, it's problematic enough, mate, for me to be taking no bookings for next year so far. Um, you know, when my mum died five months ago, I did take a couple of months off. I did the full kind of 49 day bardo period and I was doing all the prayers and the seven day things and all this kind of stuff. Um, but the rest of the year was already booked in. So, you know, I had made these commitments, people were booked on the retreats, I had to do them. But as I, I've come to kind of the end of, of, of most of the retreats of this year, I've got a few more in September and stuff. Um, I'm really reevaluating next year. Um, mm -hmm. I want to take a lot more time off and do some practice. Um, it's funny, the last uh, podcast we had, I remember talking about how my lucid dreaming practice had declined. Of course, the best way to rejuvenate your lucid dreaming practice is publicly say, oh, I'm not having many lucid dreams anymore. And then I had this big resurgence, got really back into it, had some amazing lucid dreams working with the grief of my mom, amazing inner child work recently. Um, again, probably linked to the grief of my mom. I think it's my child that is still wounded, although the adult has come to come to acceptance. Um, having said that, though, uh, yeah, there is a trade off. You know, I mean, I remember in 2016, I was doing like three month retreats. I was like, lucid dreaming practice was solid, like three month silent retreats. I was there. I was, I was, I was a practitioner, not a very good one, but I was, a, I work, I could say I was, I was a practitioner. And then now things are just so busy and I'm so, it's become so popular, the topic. And that's so good because I'm really fulfilling that mission of spreading the Dharma dream state in the West as Padmas and Baba did in Tibet. But there is a trade-off. There's only so much energy in my system. There's only so many hours in the day. And I think for the last few years, that's been a very good trade-off. Um, but one of the things I'm completing in August is the facilitator training for therapists. So by August the 1st, there will be 20 of a group of 25, but at least 20 qualified psychotherapists who've done 100 hours facilitator training with me who can now offer lucid dreaming to their clients into small groups. That's brilliant because then I can take this step back next year. There's a whole group of people who can continue uh, pushing the, uh, the mission ahead. But next year, I want to do some retreat and just and learn, you know, I want to go on a lucid dreaming retreat. I want to go on a lucid dreaming retreat with, with, um, with Andrew Holacek. I want to go and on retreat with Alan Wallace again. I want to absolutely go on retreat with Delson Armstrong. Like I'm on the waiting list for like three of them. Um, and of course, I'll teach next year. I'm sure I will. And I'll probably look back on this. And say, oh, God, I shouldn't have said I'm not teaching much next year. Uh, but I will teach less next year and I'll do more retreat for myself next year. Absolutely. That is going to happen. And what's the motivation behind that urge to take more time for retreat, reclaim your practice in the midst? Because, you know, ever since I've known you, you've been widely uh, known and highly regarded as a lucid dreaming expert, best selling author, and all that. But since I've known you, all of those things have certainly increased probably tenfold. 
Mm. Um, I mean, I'm, you know, I don't know, tenfold. I can't quantify that. We've just had to have a scientist on that. I've got to be careful. But certainly you've become even more widely known, even more well-regarded and more best-selling books. So your profile and your activity has uh, exploded even from the high level it was when I first met you. So um, where, where does this, what is behind this urge or what it, why um, uh, step away from that? At least why the urge, to, we'll see what happens, of course, as you say, but why the urge to step away from this and engage in retreat? I think one, because I owe it to the people I'm teaching. Um, you know, I still have a lucid dreaming practice, definitely, but it is not as frequent as it used to be. So I want to, in the same way as if you're working with a personal trainer in the gym, you would expect that personal trainer to be in pretty good shape, right? You, they should be an embodiment of what they're doing. So there's that. But also it is an urge, man. It's a thirst for the Dharma. It's like, you know, this weekend that's just been has been the first weekend that I haven't been teaching for like almost three months straight. And it was a weekend where I had a day on Lama Zangmo's course at the London Amazon Buddhist Center. And then on Sunday, I had the Bardo group meeting, um, which is a group of volunteers that help people with their funeral services and stuff like that. And out of the whole three months, kind of the thing I was looking forward to most was this weekend of us going to the Buddhist Center and like oh, doing some practice, receiving teachings, doing the Bardo group stuff. You know, I wasn't as excited anymore about going to these different countries and doing these things. And they were fun and I absolutely gave it my all. But I can just feel this longing for practice. It's like a plant without water, you know, you, you, you just you feel it. And then I do it and I just feel so like not even good. It's not like a pleasure thing, but just this sense of like waking up in the morning and doing my practice. The rest of the day is always good. It's like that sets me up. It's like food. You know, I feel starved of that. And I want to get back to eating regular Dharma food uh, for the benefit of myself and others. Yeah, very interesting indeed. You are a practitioner at heart, it seems. Heart still, but not in body for a, a bit. So I need to re-embody that. Yes. Yes, well, of course. Uh, we can all say that, I think, to an extent. And of course, I, you know, I will... I can already think of things I'm excited about doing next year, you know, teaching wise, like I'm excited about the Holy Isle retreat. I'll definitely do that. I'm excited about working with the veterans. I'll definitely do that. Uh, and I'm excited about the kind of further trainings with the therapist. Yeah. Things I'm excited about um, and are really, really beneficial. I just think the days of me, like every weekend doing a retreat in a different country, um, you know, I'm 40 this year too. Sorry, this is, this, <laughs> This probably contextualize a lot. I'm 40 in a month, a month and one day, August the 12th, I'll be 40. So I guess there's that too, this kind of uh, just reevaluation of what I'm up to and what I'm doing. And um, yeah, there's that too. Very interesting. Well, thank you. We've had our, our PS here. Yeah, who knew? A bit, of a, a bit of a look behind the curtain of Charlie Morley's that are working. So that's very interesting indeed. Thank well, you. You're a very good interviewer, Steve. Not only... Uh, for all the great kind of interview techniques you use, but because I think you make people feel um, safe enough just to talk. You know, you ask questions and I answer them and then I literally forget we're, we're, this is being recorded, this is going to go on the internet and other people are going to see it. But that's great, that's lovely and I think you get the best of your guests from that. Uh, and as I said, this is the only podcast that I am like subscribed to and listen to on a, you know, weekly or monthly basis. Um, yeah, so props to you, my friend. Thank you, Charlie. That means a lot. Well, this has been great and uh, good luck with everything. Good luck with the study and all that is coming out next. I'm sure we'll have another episode in the future, certainly when the, when the next, this, this current study is published. It would be wonderful to have a discussion about that. Charlie Morley, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for listening to another Guru Viking podcast. For more interviews like these, as well as articles, videos, and guided meditations, visit www.guruviking.com.